active energic skeleton that you will become finito energics. Uh, or energetically um, energized. Um, you know where this is coming from? I pray that you might become active in the sharing of your faith, in Kanonites Christios, which means the sharing of your faith. So that you might have a full understanding, that is, a practical understanding we'll see, of every good thing we have in Christ. The good things that are yours in Christ. The question, the basic question, well, it, it, it's, it's becoming active in sharing their faith in Paul's praying for. The question is, what does that mean? Active in sharing their faith. And it comes down, honestly, I'll bowl down a lot for you here. There's a little verbiage about this. But it comes down to, does that mean sharing your faith here in the Sunday? Does that mean sharing your faith out there? 24-7-365. Which does it mean? Does sharing the faith mean with one another or with outside us? And David Powell makes a lot of the verb being more likely, more likely to be in the active transitive sense rather than the active intransitive. And then he says, although certainty is not possible. <laughs> no, it isn't. So what you do is you go to the context. sharing your faith with one another. It could be a verse about sharing your faith with people outside. The point is, as far as I'm understanding things, why do those two things have to be exclusive? Mm -hmm. isn't, isn't the good things we have in Christ best known out there and shared out there when they're also shared in here? Isn't one of the most effective ways we've got flesh on the bones for people who look at us and think we're a bunch of fantasists isn't that what's coming up again? Isn't, it, isn't the best way we do that by showing them what Christian community looks like? What the love of the brethren looks like? Showing them what the love of God, you know, some reflection of what the love of God for them is like? If the love of God's going to be made known to people as we share our faith with them, then surely that's best done in a setting or a context where our love for one another that we've received from God ourselves is made tangible. It might best be done in a functioning Christian community. What I tell you gets made real in the place where I show it to you. Does that make sense? That's how we've got to get it to come. For something. Does that make sense? What I tell you gets made real in the place where I show it to you. Now, you see this word epignosis, that you may have a full understanding, the English translations tend to say, of every good thing you have in Christ. That word is not a theoretical knowledge, it is a thorough knowledge, it is a working knowledge, it is an understanding. It's what you get in an apprenticeship, not in an A-level. Trust me, if you want to understand every good thing we have in Christ, you're much more likely to learn it outside a library. Does that make sense? Anyway, whether the intention is to pray for evangelism or fuller fellowship, the end result is to motivate Philemon on the basis of the greatness of the gospel of grace. To show grace and free his slave. It's got to hit, the rubber's got to hit the road. I pray you may become active, you know, get on with it, in the sharing of your faith so that you may have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Christian love then, three nitty gritties on, on this verse. Christian love is active, not passive, and what it does is that it actively shares its faith. Does that make sense? Christian love is active and passive, and what it does, what it actively does, is share its faith, because they're lost. They're lost. Until Jesus finds them. There's nothing worse than lost. There's all sorts of other things we can help them with. We can help them with, you know, a food bag, or we can help them with some money, or we can help them with some care and attention, or we can help them by being a good neighbour to them when their lawnmower breaks down, I don't know, something like that. Okay, but, they're lost. Actively does so. Paul is therefore praying that the reality of Philemon's love, which may be a little bit pietistic, may be a bit theoretical and sitting back, maybe, that it will become more fundamentally energetic. Get stuck in Philemon. To share in your faith. That share in your faith thing. It means fellowship in the sense of a cooperative body of people doing their. Thing. And you 
what we seem to have is a, a more unusual sense of that word, which refers, refers to actively going and sharing your faith with people. Do you know what I mean? Share your faith with one another as a Christian community, and you put a working demonstration of its reality before those who currently see the church as a bunch of ridiculous, deluded fantasists. Because that's the situation we're in. If there's that community sharing faith going on, we can share it. But I need to see that. It is your faith, and you know, it is the faith you've got to have. But having it, you can share it. Um, has anybody heard recently of Mark Driscoll's controversial new book, A Call to Resurgence? We hear about it in Cardiff, because things like that happen in Cardiff, and California, and places beginning with C. Um, he's brought this book out, and it's caused a big ruck, because against it, another big name, John held a conference, and this conference was called the Strange Fire Conference. And the point of that conference was to say that you can't be a charismatic and a Christian, explicitly stated in the book and in the conference. What a blessing. And it's based on a lot of systematic theology. So understandably, the reformed charismatic people in America went up in arms. And there's this real potential for huge disagreement and division going on. Well, that book, Strange Fire, came out, and now, next week, I think, Mark Driscoll's book, A Call to Resurgence, comes out. And amongst other more controversial things, the point of the book is to ask whether Christianity is going to have a funeral or a future. He's a really good communicator. Yeah? He's not necessarily show, showing always, that one of the criticisms of it is he doesn't always show a great deal of discernment, but he does some really good things as well. In that book he says this, we've got work to do. There are lost people to reach, churches to plant, nations to evangelise. Hell is hot, forever is a long time, and it's time to stop making a dent and start making a difference. Very good. This is no time to trade in boots for flip-flops. The days are darker, which means our resolve must be stronger and our convictions clearer together. It's our time to stop making a dent start making a difference. We need to become, Paul's word, active, energetic in the sharing of our faith, but more so in our time because the days are darker. And here's the purpose Paul picks out for doing that. How odd. So that you might have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. What's that about? Right, there's, here's the purpose Paul picks out for doing that. First. If you want a practical working knowledge and understanding of every good thing we have in Christ, you will see him expounding that to you as he reshapes and remodels broken lives that are exposed to the preaching of the gospel. You want to see every good thing we have in Christ? Share your faith with somebody and see what happens in them. Yeah? Wow. There's the exposition for you. There's where you learn. It is preaching the Bible that changes people and expands in their changing faces very often the good things we receive from Jesus Christ. I remember the first time I ever saw that in my first pastoral charge. You know, it was a mess there. I went to a chaotic situation. Whoever allowed that? Whoever allowed me of all people to go to that? Uh, one particular guy who appeared, trusted Christ. And we first noticed when we noticed that his face was starting to change. His face was changing. Soaked up Bible preaching. Nothing clever, just getting the book out and unfolding it every week. Amazing. And we've seen it since. Consistently since. You want to know every good thing you've got in Christ. You want to be appreciative of what the gospel is and does. Because you're your faith with somebody and see it happen. I pray, says Paul, that you might become active, Philemon, not just in showing this tremendous hospitality and so on and nice to us, in the sharing of your faith so that you might have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Every good thing. See that? It is good things we receive from this Jesus. Who would have believed that? How does our church communicate to most people? It's good things we've got in Jesus. Because they think the opposite, so they don't want to come. 
Okay, so that's the score then. Paul starts praying for Philemon, but runs into a wall of thanksgiving for all the reasons he's listed. And once he gets over that wall, or through that wall, he prays that Philemon will become active in sharing his faith inside and outside the fellowship. For this reason, that he might really grasp the good things we've got in Jesus, and he sees that expanding in the changing lives of the people around him. who are receiving Christ and being changed. Sound good? Here we go. Paul prays for a reason. And he tells us there's a reason because he uses the word that means for. And some of the translations haven't got that word for that accounts for that. And this, that accounts for this. Because I pray this way, I pray thankfully, I pray these things for you, but I pray because I have great joy and encouragement from your love. Because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. The truth is, you go along with the stuff you rejoice in that encourages your spirit. Even the poor. Are you happy here? See, Paul's experience of Philemon's fellowship left him joyful and encouraged. I mean, I long you, you that should be your experience here, here among us. I long for that. Don't, don't we long for that for one another? Of course, there are times when people come along to church and you want them to be happy here, but they can't. I'm not suggesting you should be candidates for that, by the way. <laughs> okay? Don't do that. <laughs> Please don't. But it happens, and you've got to be ready for that. Churches up and down this land, I spoke with a number of leaders last week around the land who were finding this, where people go, but they are doggedly not happy there. Doggedly not happy in that congregation. And they keep going. But they don't like it. You wish they'd go away. Because they are not supportive. They are not helpful. And their passive but effective opposition doesn't help the work. The work hinders it. Just through sitting there glowering. And they're not doing their souls any good either because they're, they're growing bitter and twisted. How very different is Paul's description of finding them. Paul has got great joy from this man that he mentors. Paul has great encouragement from this younger brother's God-honouring love. It's great when that happens. More than that, Paul sees that the hearts, not just the bodies receiving Philemon's house church hospitality, not just the bodies are refreshed when they come in with a nice drink or a biscuit. Yeah. The souls are being refreshed. And they experience the love of his home. Why would that lead Paul to pray? Paul's encouraged by this love. His love is the evidence of the reality of the gospel. And Paul recognises here's somewhere that God is for real at work. Paul sees the evidence of the grace of God, is encouraged, rejoices and prays. Because this is where it's happening. This is where God is at work. God is at work. And people go for that. And people support that. We need to be clear that God is actually answering that prayer. What we do on a, on a board here is very important, you know. When we stick on the wall, you know answers to prayer, how God has been at work and, and actually find other things to pray. It's very important that you read. God is at work amongst us. How odd is that? One, two, three, four, five. How many of us? Right, a few. Um, but, actually God's singularly at work. And Karis is a great blessing in which he consistently says to me, Dad, but Dad, and Dad, you know, you've got to remember, <laughs> God is at work, God is doing, God is... She do like that. Good thing. Paul is encouraged by that. And he's got great joy from this love he sees in this guy. How do you know it? How do you see it? Because Philemon's refreshed the hearts of the saints. Hospitality is an important thing, isn't it? It's a big thing in our culture, actually. And to press the refresh button now, but perhaps and learn how we can be uh, doing what Philemon's doing. Anybody think of their lunch yet? It's food now, anyway. Um, conclusion. <laughs> conclusion for you. Philemon has got a good thing going on with the love of God as he expands it in and through the missional community in that church at Colossae, which meets in Philemon's home. It's got a good thing going on. Would you want to go there? I want to go there. I can't. I'd love to go to Philemon's house and see what happens. How'd you do that? That's brilliant. I'd be interested.
interested in that. And having God there, would you want to be part of that? It sounds pretty good. See, we started with that question about why on earth young people want to go to what in our culture we might describe as a traditional sort of church. I don't think anyone would want to not go to Kalima's house for church. It's great. It's a good thing going on. See, we might have all sorts of answers to our, of our own to, to that question. Why, why wouldn't you want to go there? It's no use to us at all if we spend our time concentrating on why on earth nobody would want to go to somebody else's church. Why on earth would anyone be open to the idea of coming to our church? And having come here, why on earth would they want to be part of it? You've got to be quite motivated to come back, you know. It's not that easy, is it? Okay, last time we saw part of the answer is in the way they do things. Apostolic teams. Seeking first the kingdom of God. Sometimes getting in trouble with the authorities, but pursuing God. You know, a church that's pursuing God is a, an attractive proposition. Shared ministry. Meeting in homes. Being conditioned by, if not saturated with grace. We saw that last time. This time, love for all the saints expressed in Christian hospitality. Refreshing not just the bodies, but the hearts of the saints. Love for all God's people. Faith, actively, energetically, explicitly shared. Inside the Christian community, evangelistically outside of it. This is a welcoming, accepting group of people. Yeah, you're a mess. You need Jesus just the way I do. I know. What I know is that those are the characteristics and those are the priorities that Paul is reinforcing for Philemon and for Colossae. I, I know these are the emphases we need to be the sort of place our people around here will go to. I don't know how to get there. I've got some ideas. Right? You know what I ideas. I think we're just going to have to experiment. And experiments don't always work, you know. They don't always work. You've got to have love in a church for, for experiments to be tried and they don't work. <laughs> you have, you really have. Sometimes you've got to just try something. And maybe, you know, God changes it along the way. Or he morphs it into something else. You've got to try something here. Because to pursue those biblical priorities, they've got to be a priority for us. And the question for us is, are we secure enough in our love for the Lord Jesus, our love for the saints, trusting in Him, 